This event or presentation is being taped by the Community Television Network and will be available to watch on Time Warner Cable Channel 5 in the greater Portland area and on demand on their website, which is ctn5.org. And we just want to thank CTN. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Rich Merck, who has come down tonight from Otisfield. He is the president of SWOM, the Small Woodland Owners of Maine. He's in his fourth year as president. This is almost unprecedented. Uh, so you, you, to, for somebody to do this for that long is, is great. Um, he has developed, I think it would be correct to say, a personal interest in succession planning. He owns land in Otisfield. He's got all the problems all of us do. He's got kids. Not really sure. Well, I'll let you tell us. That story. has nothing to do with the land. <laughs> so he's developed a personal interest and Swome is basically trying to move forward with this and formalize it, I think would be the correct, and he'll tell you about that. And uh, I think it's at least my pleasure to introduce Rich. He is, uh, in addition to his fourth year uh, as Swome president, he's a retired executive with Hancock Lumber. If you were their financial guy for a long time, right? So been long and deep in trees. <laughs> Rich, please. Thank you, Richard. You, you haven't heard anything yet, so uh, don't climb yet. <laughs> Brian, is this good? Okay, how far can I go either way? Not like that? Okay. I like to move around. Um, I passed out an outline um, of some thoughts about succession planning, and you're welcome to keep them, you're welcome to write on them. Um, but I thought if I gave you the general gist, uh, it would save you time having to write while I talked. Um, my presentations are formal only in that I've got an outline and I try to follow it, but they're usually pretty informal. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions or make comments whenever you want, and because uh, I really do like a pretty informal process. Um, I have found through my conversations with people about succession planning that um, a lot of us have many of the same issues, many of the same concerns. And uh, so if we get into a conversation and we go off track a little bit, I may try and bring us back on only out of interest for time. But, but I find that that can be very helpful. Um, I've done all day workshops on this subject and I've always found that the people who left with solutions to their succession plans, um, you typically got it from other people who were in the room that day because we do a lot of talking when we do that. But um, let me start out with a couple uh, remarks about succession planning and then I'm going to ask you to give me some information. I consider succession planning to be applicable to not only woodlands or fields or farms, but basically to any resources you have in your ownership. It, to me, is the first phase of estate planning. It's trying to decide what you want to do with what you have. And for younger people, that may not seem as interesting or relevant or important as it is to some of us who are older and have put a lifetime into working the land and now want to make sure that that effort is not going to be lost on the next owner because they do something totally different with the land. I don't want to play God or whoever you believe in, but at the same time, uh, I've made a big investment in that land of my time and effort, and I, and I want to know that the kinds of things that I think are important to protect the earth are the kinds of things um, that I need to spend a little bit of time on thinking about what's going to happen. So succession planning to me is the process whereby you decide what you're going to do with your resources. After that, um, you're probably going to get into estate planning. And I'm not going to spend time talking about estate planning. I'm not qualified to. But typically, uh, my experience has been you find a good accountant. If you have a lot of resources, you certainly find a, a good attorney to document in the legal documents, uh, such as a will or a trust, what needs to be done to, to set up the plans that you want so that they can be implemented. Um, whenever you think it's time to, whether it's when you die or whether it's ahead of time or what have you. So succession to planning to me is the first part of estate planning. Um, you're probably going to hear me say it several times tonight. There's 
a real need to accept the fact that at some point if you're doing serious secession planning and estate planning that you need to develop a team of professionals. Depends on what you're going to do with it and I'll talk about some of the options you have in a couple minutes but um, you need to, ha as I said, you need to have an accountant, you probably need to have an attorney, you probably need to have maybe even a financial advisor, you may need a consulting forester, some families may need a, um, a mediator to help them deal with the issues, <coughs> political issues within the family. Uh, one of the things I have found that have held most people back from doing succession planning um, is the fact that they're concerned about the different interests their children have or the different economic um, situations that their children are in. Some are very well to do and others are don't have a thing and they're just struggling to get by and, and they're saying to me I don't know how to bring all this together into a place where we can create a family plan. Well I believe there are resources available. I don't have them but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. So what I want to know from you is why did you come tonight? Besides the food was great. Whoever brought it. Thank you very much. So you folks came because you were told to? No? It was recommended. I was <laughs> You were forced. We wanted to go. Okay. Do you folks have uh, any, did you come with any particular goals? I just to learn more about uh, the uh, succession planning and uh, just getting myself and my spouse to think a little bit more about that. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Over here, sir. An old fellow told me, and some might know, Carl Libby has been going for quite a while. He told me one day, and I didn't think too much of it at the time, but he says, my bounty has become my burden. And that's pretty much what a lot of situations are. Our bounty is now our burden. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Anything else? Richard. I guess I'm concerned. I guess the, uh, the child. <laughs> may end up with all the stuff that we have, all the junk, uh, doesn't seem to be particularly interested in, in that. At least I haven't deducted him. He's a lawyer, so he should, you know, respond to this stuff, but I'm not getting any good vibes from that. Well, that's so. a mark against him anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's married to a good woman. Yeah. I, I know the good woman. Yeah, she's, okay. she's wonderful. Um, okay, anything else? I have kids. I have kids. Right. Do they have an interest? We think so. They say they do. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about that. I was lucky. Pardon? I said I was lucky. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent, sir. I don't want to speak to my own self-interest, but I will. <laughs> I'm here as to represent one of those resources you speak to to yep. get a good estate planning attorney, financial advisor, what have you, so that you do you, you don't uh, fail to plan, but that you plan ahead, especially the younger folks. Um, they have time on the side. Um, but to look at the resources that you have and figure out how best to do as equitable a job as you can in that succession planning, which is the beginning of state planning. The, the reason I got involved, in a little background, and then I'm going to get off the first page pretty quickly. The uh, reason I got involved in succession planning uh, a couple years ago was I was uh, sitting at some meeting, I was there as the president of Swome, and somebody mentioned a statistic that 45% um, of all the woodlands, non-industrial owned woodlands in the state of Maine was owned by people, or is owned by people, who were 65 years of age or older and that over 60% of all the land in Maine that was non-industrially owned was owned by people who were 55 years and older. So um, it struck a number of us that that was a pretty big exposure um, when we look at the kind of change of use we've seen with land, particularly in the southern part of the state, but anywhere in the state along good road arteries or other resources uh, there's been a lot of change of use and uh, um, 
we got to thinking about this and we thought we need to help these people think about what they want to have happen with their land. And um, as I got involved in that, I began to, I moved to Maine 35 years ago to become treasurer of Hancock Lumber when it was a little company that did about $7 million a year back in the end of the 70s. And um, um, I've seen a lot of change just in that 35 years, but I've lived here long enough that I really feel like I'm a Mainer. So bear me that, that uh, privilege. Um, and I really want to see us protect the land. Um, I can't remember where I was going to go with that thought, so I'll <laughs> stop. But, but as I got involved in this and realized that there had been a huge demographic change in the state of Maine. People um, used, to mul used to live in the same house together, three different generations, grandparents, parents, and children all live in the same house. A lot of those families work the land together. A lot of the information that the grandparents knew was transferred through daily activity to the other two generations so that they had the knowledge. Now we're in a circumstance where our children move away. Uh, we're not living in the same house. We're not working the land the way we used to in many cases. In many cases you folks are, but let me tell you, you're the exception in Maine. A lot of people live in the cities. Um, we don't have the same transfer of knowledge. We don't have the same appreciation for the land. And I suspect, I think, I know it's true with my own children, we don't have the same interest in the land. <coughs> so um, we decided we put together um, a group of programs like this one. <coughs> I put together an outline. We're right now, Swoam has just gotten a grant to uh, we're working with Orno on this, uh, with the associate professor, uh, Jessica Leahy, and her graduate students. We're putting together a handbook on secession planning for people in the state of Maine. When you leave here tonight, understand that there are a number of, of organizations that around the country, whether they're farming organizations or forestry organizations or land trusts or state agencies, or the milk industry or whatever. They've all put together a lot of great literature and a lot of good input uh, about secession planning. And most of it's available um, either in PDF format or just on the screens uh, on your computer. So go on and do searches for land search, uh, for secession planning or what have you. The first page of my outline you can read it anytime you want to, but the outline basically gives you reasons for why the family landowners are the ones that really matter on preserving our land for the future, uh, particularly as it relates to current uses. Um, when we go back and we look at why do people own woodlands, and the same thing could be true of farms, I'm sure, uh, and by the way, I've never seen a farm that didn't have a tree farm on it or didn't have a, a, a woodlot somewhere on it. So uh, I kind of consider them all woven together pretty tight. But when we go back and they've, and they've done national surveys, the U.S. Forest Service has, and they ask people, why do you own your land? And in the case of woodlots, they don't get to the commercial value or the investment value of the land until item or priority level number seven. It's things like aesthetics, recreation, peace of mind. Uh, it's where I live, um, hunting and fishing, all kinds of other reasons, but investments isn't the only reason. So it shows that the people have a lot of personal care in their properties. Um, I'm going to spend tonight talking about what I consider to be the five different options of how you can deal with your land. And then I'm going to tell you how you might approach putting a succession plan together. Would that fill a lot of your needs? Yep. Would that be all right? Yep. Okay. So, and I think there's one other thing. I'm going to take this out of order, but there's one other thing I'm going to jump to. Um, I'm on the bottom of. Uh, I'm on the bottom of page. I see I can do this so so off my head that I don't even look at these things. 
I guess I'm at the bottom of page three, additional thoughts. I think this is a good background to give you before I, before I talk about the five different reasons. If you're going to deal with your family, if at some point I think everybody should talk to their family. In my case, I assumed my daughters would have an interest in the land. This is how our, our farm is the only place our daughters ever lived. A little background about our daughters. My wife and I adopted our daughters from the Philippines. They're biological sisters. They came to us when they were one and three. Came at the same time. And so this is the only place that's been home to them that they consciously remember. Um, one lives in Bangor now and has two children. The other one lives in Boston and has uh, a daughter. And um, I just assumed that they would have an interest in land and they'd want to keep that tie. But when we, in fact, started doing our own secession plan and I talked to them and my wife talked to them, they said, no, we don't have any interest in it. So I feel good that my, Beth and I, my wife's name Beth, and you'll hear me refer to her, um, I feel good that we decided that we can pretty much do whatever we want with the land now because they've been asked and they've given us their input. When we solidify the plan and have it finally figured out, I'll want their blessings for it. But I feel good that we've asked them and I feel particularly good that they, that they were uh, willing to give us an honest answers. I also suspect that their interests may change as they get older. Their children are already beginning to love to come to the farm and they want to be outside and they want to be in the woods with grandpa and, and so I think their moms may have a different interest as they get older. But right now my daughters are 28 and 29. They're in what I call the survival mode. Some of you may be able to relate to this. But they're just trying to figure out how they're going to get by every week on on the money they've got and on the time they've got for themselves and their family and their careers. I suspect when they're 40 or 50 that may change. So if I can live to be 80 or 90, um, maybe um, they'll have a stronger interest and they'll, they'll change the secession plan at that point, although I kind of doubt it. Um, but anyway, death and our demises, my wife's and my deaths, are not a pleasant subject for our children to talk about. The first time I approached my daughters, they individually, at different times, said to me, Dad, I don't want to talk about this. Which was very sweet, until I reminded them that I hadn't ever met anybody who hadn't figured out how to get out of it. <laughs> uh, postpone it, maybe, but not get out of it. Um, our children would rather have us be living than have the land or any of our other resources. I think that's true most of the time. Um, our children may think that they're being dis disrespectful if they try to talk about what's going on on the land. They may feel like they're making you uncomfortable that they're trying to butt in. If we want our children to want the land after we're gone, we're going to have to allow them to develop their own emotional ties. And without feeling like they're horning in on us and our ties that we have with the land. And I think part of that comes about just by talking about what's going on and what Beth and I are doing and, and uh, if they had an interest, what their interests were and what their thoughts were and what their plans were and we could see how we could evolve it all together. Um, if we want our children to manage our land a certain way, then we're going to have to tell them what our wishes are. There was a survey done up in Kennebec County by the Kennebec Land Trust two years ago, maybe 30 months ago now, and one of the questions they asked was, do you have ideas about what you want to have your land used for after it's gone and how you want it managed? And their answers that they got back was 80% of them said, yes, I do. The next question was something like, have you told anybody? Only, I think it was 21% had told anybody and of the hundred and some responses they had, only one person had put their thoughts in writing. By the way, there were also 60% of the people who were surveyed in that survey, and it was over 100 people, only 40% of them had wills. So they hadn't even done the basic estate planning work. Um, wills don't have to be complicated, but they at least give direction and, and they give some clarity where it might be missing otherwise. A couple more quick points. Um, 
Land can be a way to keep the, keep the family together in the future. There are many multi-generational families whose children are now spread out all over the globe who, because they have a family organization set up for the future ownership of that <coughs> land, they bring the kids back home once a year. They get to see each other once a year, no matter where they've been. They get to talk about the farm and what's going to happen to the woodlands and what's going to happen to the fields and all that, and whatever businesses that land may be involved in. And then um, they, they, uh, they get to have a stronger social contact. I've got one brother that I see who lives in New Jersey, and I see him about every four years. And uh, maybe if we had some common interest, um, we'd be we'd have a better uh, life relationship than we do right now. Um, if you didn't happen to come with your spouse tonight, and you have one, or you have another owner in the land, um, you should be cognizant and aware of what their wishes are as well. I'll talk about that later on. One of the things you need to be thinking about when you go through succession planning is, is what do your children want? I know what my children want right now, which is they want to get through the day. But, <laughs> but um, um, you know, what are their long-term goals? What do they want? How do they, how do they relate and tie into mind? What are they willing to work for? If you, have a, if you have a child who has some kind of dependency issue or has, um, is overwhelmed with marital problems or children, special <coughs> children with special needs, they may not be able to work as hard to protect the farm and maintain it as another child might be able to. So what are they willing to do? Where are their focuses? Where are their priorities? Um, and that also ties in with the next one, which is what are your kids' needs? They may not have any, their needs may not tie to anything that has to do with the land. Um, and I already talked about the last one, which is the maturity level. So quickly, that's a background for, let's talk about what I think are the five options of, different options of the ways you can use your land or deal with your land. Let's assume you have an interest in your land and you may or may not want to define what's going to happen or how that land is going to be used once you can no longer be its steward. Let's assume that you have an interest in the land, you own it, you got it either through inheritance or you bought it or you bought a house and the land came with it. If you don't have a high interest in what's going to happen to it in the future, the first option is the easiest one and it's the most obvious one. You can sell it whenever you don't want it anymore or you can have your estate liquidate it when you die. You don't have to put any strings on it because you're not concerned about how it's going to be used in the future. You're going to let the next buyer do with it whatever they want. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the first option. Um, you may decide that maybe you don't want to just be that uncaring. You may want to help pick the next buyer or you may want to interview the next buyer. I don't know. But the first option is sell it now or sell it when you die. Uh, have your estate sell it. And we've got a whole system with realtors and everything else built into ways you can do that. The second way, and some of you will like to hear me saying this, is to give part or all of your land value to a land trust. If you have an interest in the land, you like the land, you want to define how it's going to be used in the future. There are, at present count, I think 108 land trusts in the state of Maine. Some of them are statewide, like the Swome Land Trust. Some of them are regional land trusts, like the Three Rivers. And some of them are particular to a particular town. Um, but they may um, have an interest. Certainly, it's a way of getting your land um, to be managed by an organization in the future uh, and in the negotiations with the land trust you could determine uh, whether you have a common philosophy a common philosophy of how that land is going to be managed in the future I'm not 
kicking anybody. I'm not challenging any ideals here. I just want to mention different philosophies. Some land trusts are of the attitude in the state of Maine, because they've talked to me and I've talked to them uh, and others, that they want the land to be forever wild. They want nothing to happen on it. Or if anything happens on it, they will allow light recreation. They may or may not allow hunting. They'll probably preclude the use of any mechanized vehicles. Um, may or may not allow cross-country skiing and hiking. Um, and their ideals are at that end. The other end may be a land trust that says, we're going to manage our woodlands sustainably. We're going to harvest them regularly because we think it makes it a healthier forest. It also gives the land trust some revenue stream so that they can offset some of their administrative costs of being of overseeing. And anywhere in between there is whatever you negotiate with the land trust. The Swan Land Trust has been in existence since I think the late 80s, early 90s. We have 26 parcels of land and we have 16 easements we hold. The 26 parcels of land, each one is a parcel that has a uh, conservation easement on it. There's, I think there's two that don't have conservation easements, but the rest have conservation easements and no two easements are identical. Uh, it, the, when they did the gifting of the property, it came with some particular restrictions. There's one parcel, for example, in Winthrop that doesn't allow honey. Um, most of the parcels don't. The only thing that the owners as woodland owners, members of Swole, or tree farm or whatever they were, um, had in mind was that they wanted to know that that land would remain a woodlot. And so they just wanted to make sure it was going to be managed um, sustainably. And um, so I've said the second option, first option was sell the land whenever you want. Second option is give the land to the land trust. Let's call that 2A. 2B is keep the land, but negotiate with the land trust and give them a conservation easement. Ask them to hold a conservation easement on your property so that uh, you can define what uses you will allow and what uses you won't allow on that land. And after you're gone, it's up to them to look at that document and make sure that that land is being managed uh, according to the conditions and the terms of that easement. Now, a comment about conservation easements, and I don't know if it was <coughs> Ellen or somebody else said next month you're going to try and do a program, or yeah, maybe, maybe Carl, yeah, that, that you folks may be doing a program on conservation easements, which would be a great thing. A typical conservation easement that Swarm takes whether it's putting it on the property that's coming or whether it's just a separate conservation easement uh, that we become responsible for, runs between 18 and 22 pages long. There are page long definitions of what is a gravel pit. There are several page descriptions of what is sustainable uh, woodland management. And those have grown. If any of you remember, the Pingree family put about 800,000 acres of land uh, under conservation easements 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of land down east, that easement was 13 pages long. Now the same type of easement is 18 to 22 pages because Richard's son, son has, uh, no, because lawyers have had to, in certain circumstances are such that, you know, we've had to expand the definitions, ex expand the words of what we want so that the message is clear of what we want or don't want. Conservation easements are an interesting tool and they, you need to realize as a landowner that if you ask an organization, a nonprofit, typically a nonprofit organization, to hold an easement on your property that they're accepting a liability. They're accepting a responsibility that they are going to remember, typically on an annual basis at least, to look at what was required in that easement, go to the land, walk the land, look at the land, and make sure it's being managed that way. Okay? 
Uh, we took an easement several years ago on a piece of land, and the current owner, we actually took it on uh, land that had been owned by the uh, Nature Conservancy, and TNC had seven parcels in the state of Maine, small parcels they didn't want. They came to us and they said, we'll give you this one parcel with a conservation easement on it, and then on these other, I guess there were another seven parcels, we want to sell the land but we want you to hold the conservation easements on those other seven parcels. Well, when they did that, we, and we said, we worked out a deal, and we said, sure. Um, and since then, they've sold, it, sold those other seven parcels to a new owner, and the new owner is not following the conservation easement. Well, Swome, I was just in a two-hour conference call today, Swome is responsible now to go to the new owners and say, you didn't do what you were supposed to, you have to do that. You're not managing this land sustainably. This land isn't of a condition, it doesn't have the kind of inventory now that we think can even be, um, that, that can allow it to be certified, which was one of the conditions that, tree, that the TNC put on the easement when they, when they gave us the easement. So we have an obligation now at our own cost to go enforce what the responsibilities were or what the conditions were that were in that easement. So land trusts don't just walk around with their hands out and say, gee, I'd love to hold all the conservation easements you can give me. Because in fact, it's a liability. But in order to get, I know for our land trust, I can't speak for yours, but for our land trust, in order to know that that land is going to be available in the future as forestry managed on a sustainable basis, we'll make that effort. And quite frankly, the other thing we'll do is if somebody comes to us and says, we want to give you a conservation easement, we're going to say, well, we won't take it unless you give us an endowment. We've got to have some money. We say, if we look at the land and we'll say, well, we think this land's going to cost us $1,000 a year in actual out-of-pocket expenses, travel, and management time. So we're going to want an endowment of $20,000 because 5% of $20,000 is about $1,000. If that's how much money we can earn on it, that offsets our cost. But every year on all the parcels we get, we get aerial photos from the Sewell company after they've flown them. We actually look and see if there's any changes on the ground from the aerial view, if there's been any harvesting, if there's new trails. If there's something that doesn't look right there, we go to the land, we walk it, and then in the case of this one parcel, when we did that, we found out they had done a harvest without having it approved ahead of time. We found it was a heavy harvest. They've got some erosion problems, and there's some other issues. Lee. Question. Um, there's various definitions of uh, sustainable harvest, and you know you can write into your your uh, secession plan that you want it, you know, third party certified. Would you ever accept land, would SWOM ever accept land that had a certification standard that you thought was too onerous given the size of the land that you were being given? Um, I can't speak for SWOM, but I suspect we wouldn't if we thought it was too onerous. But there are six that international certification process, one of which is American Tree Farm System, which has no cost for the landowner right now. So there are, and they've all got pretty much a common, a common um, description of what sustainability is. It keeps moving, it keeps evolving, but they're all pretty much in stride with each other. So, but I, I think that's the kind of give and take that goes on between a land trust and a property owner. Um, you've got to match the culture of the land trust with the expectations of the landowner. Um, and as I said, in, in the 16 easements we have, I don't think any two are identical. Did I answer your question? Or did I dodge it? I didn't mean to dodge it. I mean, we, we look at a lot of things. We look at, um, we believe, obviously, because we're swollen, we, we really believe in sustainable forestry. Um, we turned down a property last year because the man wanted 50% of it to be forever wild. We turned down another property because somebody wanted us to guarantee that, that 
It had a 40 acre uh, sugar bush on it. And they wanted us to make sure it was operated every year. You know, that's, that's not what we do. Um, so I think you kind of, again, have to match the culture of who you're talking to with, with uh, what your expectations are. Um, but I also think that it's, that's fairly wide open. So I've talked about number one, I've talked about number 2A, and number 2B, okay? Uh, conservation easements have a lot of other things that go with them. If you put restrictions on land, you reduce its value. Once you get into estate planning, you can talk about your secession plan and you decide, okay, I've got this 100 acres, it's worth half a million dollars because of where it is with the road frontage and all, but I want to restrict it to sustainable forestry in the future. So you find out that it might only be worth 200,000. Well, if you give that conservation easement to a nonprofit organization, there may be a tax deduction there. And that's why you need people like this gentleman here. That's why I will tell you time and time again tonight, you need a professional team to help you figure out if there's a value. Uh, of an advantage to you on your tax return that you might be able to benefit if you use the conservation easement. And I'm not going to spend a lot, of night, a lot of time tonight on that unless there's a real interest in it and then we get into it later on. Although I think if you do do a program on conservation easements, that, sh that would be a good segment to have in there because people don't always realize there's a tax advantage. Uh, and sometimes when you do it succession plans, you're not quite sure how you're going to make this all work or how you're going to pay all your bills or your mother's bills or whatever. Um, sometimes things like tax treatments can help you give some of the revenue you need. Sometimes you may own a piece of land that a land trust really wants. I I was on the edge of a transaction um, <clears throat> that involved Hancock Land Company, which is a related company to Hancock Lumber and they had eight different organizations involved in the transaction. It had to do with Mount Blue, the state of Maine. It had to do with land for Maine's future. It had to do with federal funds coming from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and I don't know who all the other players were. I think probably TNC was in there. Um, Audubon may have been in there, but they were talking about something like 3,500 acres and uh, they had money getting paid out and the millions of dollars and money going over here and tax deductions and there were all kinds of things going on, but it all made it work. The land got preserved, the owners got to sell it and got their cash out of it, got some cash out of it, got some tax advantages out of it, the new buyers got to get it and the land trust got to put it under protection. So those are all games you can play, but I'm not going to get that sophisticated tonight. I've still got three more categories to do. The third category, if, uh, now we're talking about family. The last three categories are family. The first one was just sell. Second one was deal with a nonprofit organization like a land trust. Third category starts the family section, and that is, um, I'm not sure if I have three and four or four and three in the next order, but here it goes. Um, Simply take that, say you own 100 acres and you've got five heirs that you want the land to go to, cut it up into 20 acre parcels and give each of them a fifth of it. Now that gets into some other issues this gentleman brought up a couple minutes ago. He talked about equality and equity. And I think there's a difference between being equal and being equitable. And I'll deal with that in a minute. But if you give everybody one fifth of the land and you've got to have to pay survey costs, you may, well, you won't have to get subdivision approval because it's going to people within the family. But you're going to have to worry about does everybody have the same access? Does that everybody have the same piece of land? Have, every, have the same value? Does one on a pond? Is one not on a pond? Is one got power? Another one not got power? You got all those issues. Plus, guess what? It's really hard on the land. You've just taken an ecosystem, a, ha a group of habitats, and one manageable piece of land and you've just made it into five separate units. Five different sets of owners who are going to have five different potential uses in mind. One may want to put a house on it, one may want to keep it as a woodlot, one may need or want the money and decides to sell it to a sixth person and you've got no control over that. So 
I don't like number three, but it's an option. And if it fits your needs, there's nothing wrong with it. But I'm not going to spend a lot more time on it either. The fourth option is use the old European method of dealing with, what you call it, bounty? Give it to the oldest child. Be done with it. That's what they used to do in Europe. Whoever was the oldest child got all the goodies. And if you had more than one child, too bad. A um, little hard on the other children, and that blows equity and, and equality right out the window. But that's one thought. I know of a family where, in, in Southern Maine, where um, for several generations, they have given the land to one offspring. But in that family's cases, they've had enough other resources, enough other bounty, enough other assets that they had other things to give the other children. And in that family, in each generation, one child came forward and said, I want to be the next steward of land. I want to manage the land. I love the land. I'd be all happy to be land poor and give the insurance policies and the stocks and bonds and the other real estate that isn't here in Maine to my siblings. So they've been able to be equitable or equal. But they gave all the woodland to one child because they expressed an interest. And that actually happened two generations in a row. Um, so when I talk about give it all to the oldest or give it all to one, which is option number four, that sounds pretty blunt and awful until you realize you may have other resources to play with and you can balance <coughs> this thing out. And that's where it begins to pay to talk to your children and say, what do you want? Because in this case of this family in Maine, only one child wanted the land. Um, in one of my workshops, we had, we had a woman who was in her 80s. She had two sons. One was a Maine forester, had some position with the uh, Maine Department of Forestry. And he lived near her, and he worked the land on weekends. His brother lives in New York and is in public accounting and is doing quite well and had, returns to Maine once a year to see his mother. Has no interest in the land. And the other son wants the land badly. And when that woman came into the workshop, she said to me, when we went around, did introductions, and I said, what do you want to get out of this? She said, I really don't know why I'm here because I can't figure out, I can't solve my problem. Well, by the end of the day when she left, she and her deceased husband had talked about this before he passed away wanted her forestry son to have the land. But they wanted to let their other child know that they cared about him and they wanted to treat him equally. And uh, as we talked, and her only resources was the house she lived in and the land that she owned uh, and a small insurance policy. Um, she owned the land. She owned the house. And she was living on Social Security and some small savings. And before the end of the day, she walked out with her solution, which was she wasn't going to treat the children equally. She was going to treat them equitably. Okay? That because she and her husband owned the land, they had a bit of a say on how things were, and the other resources, they had a bit of a say on how they were going to spread things around. And she had a family meeting, and the son from New York admitted he didn't want the land. He liked the land. It was fun to come to, but it was not an important priority in his life. And the other son said, you know, next to my family, and you, Mom, this is it. I really want the land. So the, the son in Maine and the son in New York and the mom worked out a deal where the son in New York will get some cash, the son in Maine will get the land when she dies, he'll go to the bank, he'll sell the house, because he already has a house nearby. He'll sell the house and the house lot, and that'll give some cash to his brother. And he'll go to the bank and get a mortgage for a certain amount of money on the land, and he'll give that to the brother. And the brother won't get as much as he would have if they took all the assets and sold them on the open market, and they each took half. But he will get a good, 
amount of bounty for um, his involvement in the family and being part of the family, and he'll know that his parents loved him, but he'll also know that their wishes to have the land continue to be in, used, used for the same purpose in the future will be honored, and that has a value to him as well. So we ended up treating him equitably. And I think as you look at things, um, <coughs> I don't think it's selfish or unreasonable to say I'm the current generation of ownership and what I think about this is kind of important, as important as what my kids get or what they think in the end, because it's mine. And if that's selfish, that's selfish, but that's my personal view. Okay, so I've talked about number four. Number three was split it into five equal pieces, or split it up among all the kids, and there we get into the issues of what's equal. Number four was give it to the oldest. I've given you two examples of how Giving it to one child, giving the land to one child, if you were fortunate enough to have other resources, allowed you to work it through or at least find ways to be equitable. Number five <coughs> is a great concept, but in Maine, in a lot of ways, I think it's hard to do. It's easier to do in Maine if the people who are going to be getting the, getting the land and the farms um, have a real interest in it and are willing to work the kind of hours we all know you work on a farm. And if I spilled any beans over here I shouldn't have and they didn't know, I'm sorry. But you know, if you're willing to work the 60 or 70 hours a week to be on, or 80 hours or whatever, you, or every hour you're awake, to be on the land to make it pay so you can have a living, so you can be there, that's great. But the fifth I should tell you what the fifth level is. The fifth option is that you create a corporation or an LLC or a partnership or some kind of an organization, a legal organization, and you give the family members or the heirs that you want to have the land, you give them a ownership in that organization. Now, the organization owns the land, but the family members in the next generation or whatever, own the organization. This allows the land to remain untouched and to continue on in the use that it is currently in. And ownership can change as children die and their children's children um, take on the next level of ownership or what have you. Again, you get into an area where you probably want some counseling and you probably want some professional advice if you decide to do that. In Oregon, where this is a pretty big, strong concept, the average woodlot size out there is about 600 acres. That's enough to be harvesting 50 acres every year and creating some cash flow. In Maine, I think our average lot size is 40 or 50 acres. It's, I'm looking at Steve because he might know. He just made a face, so I don't think he does know. Um, but I've heard it's something like 40 or 50 acres for an average woodlot. Obviously, some are as small as two or three acres, and some are thousands of acres um, that are family-owned. But um, you've got to get up to a certain level of critical mass, or in the case of farms, because we've got farmers in here, you've got to create enough alternative forms of income, whether it's from raising produce or raising animals, whether it's from selling hunting leases or, or running a... Uh, cross-country ski program on your property, letting people ski through your trails, or whatever. You've got to create some other form of, of uh, revenue stream that will give you enough money to be able to pay the expenses of that organization. So I like number five conceptually. I talked about the family earlier that has one of these companies and they bring all the kids back every year for board meeting. And they fly the kids back from wherever they are in the world, and they all get together, and they have a picnic, and it's like a three or four day party. And all the grandchildren get to play together, and all the brothers and sisters and in-laws get to be together, and the grandparents get to sit back and, and watch it and know that this is going to go on. And that, to me, is an extreme case. It's also multi-generational ownership. But um, <clears throat> it's an interesting concept, and if, if you've got the resources and if you've got the family that all have a common interest in the land, that's the other thing that should probably happen, is everybody in the family in the next generation wants to continue to own the farm. 
um, then that's the kind of thing I think that makes sense. But I'm not sure it's real practical in Maine. But it is one option. I've covered the five types. Yes, yes sir. Uh, the fifth one, I think, is also used in the transitional, um, depending on what the value is to avoid the inheritance tax. You can certainly minimize it if not avoid it, yeah. Because this, depending on what the level of resources are, those shares have value. So um, you can transfer ownership over multi years if you start young enough. Right. Um, okay, so I kind of talked about, I'm about halfway through, and it's about 45 minutes since I started. So I've talked about the five options. Uh, I'm going to go on and talk about the process. Uh, it's going to probably take me 20 minutes, and then we'll have questions and answers. Does that work? Any questions before I get started? No, you cannot leave. <laughs> She's going to anyway. Well, that's the way it is in my house, too. Um, anyway, uh, the process. I've talked about talking to the family. I've given you some examples of how families have worked things out. But I think before you talk to anybody, you need to decide whether what I've said makes enough sense that you want to do it, number one. And number two, I think you need to decide what your interest level is. And number three, I think you need to decide what are your total resources? What is your total bounty? Because um, the case of the woman who had the acreage and had the two sons, um, she had more resources than she realized. And if we hadn't said to her, well, what else do you own or what do you have? And we wouldn't have known what we had to work with for, for tools to come up with a solution. So the first thing I suggest to people is you create what's called a balance sheet. If you've got a business background, you'll understand that you may not otherwise. So I'm going to explain it to you. A balance sheet is made up of all the things you own, and it shows all those items listed down. And then over here on this side, on the other side of the other page, is a list of the liabilities of what you owe. Now hopefully, if, as you get older, those get smaller or they go away. But let's say you've got assets here, and then you've got some liabilities. Maybe one of your assets was a car, or a pickup truck and it's worth $15,000 and you still owe some money on it, you still owe $5,000 under liabilities. The third part of a balance sheet is called equity or net worth. And that's simply, I got the truck for $15,000, the bank owns $5,000 of it, I own the other 10, that's mine, that's an equity. And again, your equity should be getting larger and your liabilities should be getting smaller if if you've been fortunate enough to have a good life as you get older. But you need to you need to list those out. So you need to know what do I have that I need to think about what I want a succession plan for. And things like checking accounts and savings accounts and and things like that are easy. You know, that there's no multi-generational value there other than giving it to somebody. Uh, but when you talk about land or a cabin, or a camp somewhere or uh, some special paintings or something that your great-grandfather built, um, some furniture or something, those have special value that you want to think about what you want to have happen to it. Okay, so a balance sheet gives you a background of what you've got and what you want to think about. The next thing you want to do is on page six. There's a thing here called the heirloom scale. I don't know if I would have called it that. I might call it the spectrum. But this is a self-test. <clears throat> and in my household, I gave myself this test. And I gave my wife one of these sheets with the following instructions. And we did this separate. In fact, we did the, the next, this sheet and the next sheet separate from each other. And then we got together and we compared our thoughts. The heirloom scale goes like this. Number one. The scale is 1 through 10, okay? 
and a number one would be my property is one of the financial assets in my portfolio and nothing more. I have no emotional attachment. I don't care. It's just another asset. Number 10, at the other end of the scale, is my property is a priceless family heirloom and it's to be protected at all costs. This is most significant, most important. I'm totally emotionally involved in it. And in between there, you can be a one, you can be a two, you can be a five, a seven, a 10. And so I took that and that <coughs> took that test and we came up with our thoughts. And under thoughts, we wrote down why it was as it was. And then the next worksheet was values and goals. What are my long-term goals in a perfect world for the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 30 years? What major challenges do I see standing in the way? What are my immediate goals? Okay. So after we did that, Beth and I got back together. And I have to understand my wife's a school teacher and holds her master's plus some other certificates and she's very intimidating because she writes everything out and she can express herself well and it's, it's, it's intimidating. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I love her. Um, I was a seven on the heirloom and she was a two. We ended up coming out as a six. She decided she really liked the land a lot more and she was more interested in the land than she thought she was. But her reasoning for why she was a two had to do with her goals. Because to her, it was more important what happened to our daughters and their families than it was for what would happen to the land. So she was willing to reduce her interest in the land to make sure that the girls were, were going to have the best opportunity to do as well as they could. And I had goals in my thinking that were more focused on the land. Well, I want to make sure that that gets cut, and I want to make sure those trails are kept open, and I want to make sure the fields stay mowed, and I want to make sure that we continue to have a property that people know they can recreate on if they take care of it. And I want to support the industry, and I want, uh, I want landowners to be respected. And those were my kinds of thoughts, and her kinds of thoughts were, I want to make sure that the girls get to a point in their lives where they have a little breathing room. I want to make sure that my grandchildren have the opportunity to have all the education they want and that it's paid for. Um, I want to make sure that we have time on the land, that Beth and I have time on the land together after she retires um, so that we can enjoy it. We've, we've had it for 30 years and we wanted to uh, all, all we've ever talked about is being able to be on the land um, as much as possible. A good day for us is a day that no motor starts except the John Deere. It's okay for the John Deere motor to start, but the cars and the pickup truck, they just stay in the barn. That's it. Um, that's a good day. And when I get up to three or four days and I haven't gone anywhere, I may have been on conference calls and my cell phone or whatever, but. I haven't had to go anywhere. That's a real good day. That's a real good week. Um, so those were her kinds of goals. And out of it, we came up with what we thought <clears throat> we had a plan that we both could support. That the land was more important to us, it was more important to her than she'd realized. And probably, I haven't asked her that question because the thought hadn't struck me before, but Probably part of the reason she came up on the land was because it was so important to me. Now that I think about it. And she knew, I mean, it's one of the reasons I retired five years ago was so I could spend time on the land. Um, and do things for Swam and learn more about the land. Um, but we really do share the same goals, long-term goals as it relates to the <coughs> land and the children. So once we got our goals together, we talked to the girls and we said, you know, next time you come, and our grandchildren are eight, five, and three, and at the time they were one year younger each, 
and we said to them last year, usually what happens is everybody comes Saturday morning or Friday night, mm -hmm. and then Saturday night we have a nice dinner and the kids go to bed, and we all sit around and talk or play a game before everybody goes to bed, and then Sunday morning we have pancakes and and uh, breakfast and sometimes during the, you know we go out and do stuff in the woods and then they sometimes during the day they leave. And I said, you know, this next time you come, I'd really like to have Saturday night after the kids are in bed for all of us to talk about moms and my future. Well, I really don't want to talk about your future because that's upsetting. Well, we really need to do this. And so um, I, we gave them a brief outline ahead of time. And when they came, we sat down and we said, this is what we want to do with the land. And we're not going to tell you what we have for resources because we never have. Uh, but we're going to tell you that we think we're okay. We can carry ourselves on unless something extraordinary happens. Um, but we want this is what we want for you and when, when we pass away. And uh, that conversation probably as a family meeting should be held, by the way. If you look at any of the books, they'll tell you it should be held for immediate family members only, not spouses. Because spouses may not remain spouses. Okay? And if you're talking about an heirloom of the family, if you're talking about a property that's multi-generationally owned, and many of them are, um, <clears throat> it really should involve just the family. And there are some spouses, in-laws or whatever you want to call them, who have strong personalities or they're the stronger of the two personalities in a relationship and they may have a dynamic, they may have a different interest, a different perspective that isn't related to what is the family <coughs> culture and what the family wants. So all the professional books will tell you, immediate family members only. But anyway, we let our son-in-law sit in on this one because, because uh, he's part of the family anyway and, and uh, we do. And he did. He sat there the whole night and never said a thing. Uh, his, his wife, Michelle, did the talking. Um, and she's not necessarily, they're, they're pretty equal, actually. Um, but anyway, we told them what our thoughts were. And they both came right back and said, don't have an interest in it. So um, that takes us through the family meeting. We had a family meeting. In essence, that's what that was. Now. If there's a great book, and I refer to it in here, and I'll, I'll take you back to it in a minute, but there's a great book put out by the University of Oregon on secession planning, and they say that either one of the parents ought to call the, call all the children, if you're dealing with a children's solution in your plans, and say, hey, this is what we're thinking about. We'd like you to come home. We'd like to have a family meeting. We'd like to all talk about it. Now, in some families, that works just fine. In other families, um, you really need to set things up so that they understand what the rules are going to be. You're going to respect your siblings as grown adults for who they are today, not who they were when they were your brother or your sister and you were both in your preteen years. Okay? Don't bring to the table the way they behaved or what they did to you when you were dating a girl in high school. When you come to the table, you, come to, you all come to the table today with who you are. And if somebody has a substance issue, if someone has a financial problem, if someone has a social problem or a maternity issue, you need to respect that. You need to be willing to talk about it if it comes up, but not criticize it or be objectionable about it. And if we're going to operate as a family, we're going to have to solve some of these other problems along the line of figuring out what we're going to do with mom and dad's resources. And in certain families, that may require a professional counselor. That may require a mediator. I know of one family where they said to me, we can't do this because we don't have the kind of family that can sit down and talk together. And I said, well, then what are you going to do with your land? Well, I guess we're going to let them figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get it. You get it. OK? 
Okay, I said to her, I said, how can they figure it out when you're afraid to get them all in a room right now and you're there to oversee it? <laughs> so um, she saw the point and last I knew she was talking to Jessica Leahy up in Orono to see if they could find a, a family counselor that could help the mother and father figure out how they were going to deal with their tribe. Um, in our case, our daughters decided, um, in case you haven't been following this, the Swollen Newsletter, our daughters decided they didn't have an interest in the land. Uh, I wasn't particularly shattered by it. I was probably disappointed only because of the, I'm a fairly romantic person. Um, but um, what we're going to do is We're going to do it so that the land will be sold. But sometime this year, I've set the goal by the end of 2014. Um, we may have negotiated with the land trust. In our case, it's Loon Echo or uh, Western Main Foothills. One of the, those two land trusts both serve Otis Field. Um, and, um, see if they want to hold a conservation easement on the land. Our property is 118 acres, of which 35 acres is fields, and the rest is woodlands, and it has over a half a mile of road frontage with power, and the roads are paved. So it is instant developable land. And when I worked for Hancock Lumber, I developed land because we owned uh, 13,000 acres of timberlands in southern Maine. And one of our things to do was to take a two-acre house lot on road frontage, which was, might have been part of a 100 or 200 or 300 acre wood lot that we had, sell that off, pay taxes on it, and then take the rest of the money and go buy more timberland. And the, uh, in the 30 years I was there, we went from the 5,000 acres when I got there to the 13,500 acres when I left. And that was a major part of what we did. We took valuable road frontage got rid of the tax burden, got the money out of it, and then we went and bought more land. Um, but in our case, um, and so along the way I did some subdivisions for Hancock Lumber when we had really prime pieces of land. Um, so I've done subdivisions. Um, I got a DEP award for one, so I, I feel good about the way I did it. But um, I don't want this land subdivided. And it would be almost immediately subdivided. So we're going to put some conservation easements on it. If we can find somebody that will, will hold them. Um, and we may not, we may have the wills written so that they'll be put on when we pass away. Because I still want to keep that option open in case my eight-year-old grandson decides he wants the land and he wants to work it. So uh, I'm also a very conservative individual, and I don't like the, uh, the certainty and the permanence that conservation easements create. I won't be around, but I contend in about 100 or 150 years, courts will start throwing them out. Because land will become so valuable in certain places that the courts will override the previous owner's wishes. But for the time being, they're a good thing. I like them. I'm just not. I, I want them to go on my land if I can't be the steward, but as long as I'm intellectually competent and I can be a good steward of the land, I want to hold that option open. So that's what I'm doing with my own land plan and our own stewardship plan. And uh, the other resources are all easy, other than the antiques that have been in the family for generations. And it's all just money. All right, I've rambled. I'm done. What questions do you have? Earlier you were talking about conservation easements where the new owner, after the property had been sold with conservation, the new owner did not respect the conservation easement. What teeth is there in those easements so that the new the new owner is has to correct the error? Is he is he fined <coughs> by the by the conservation? Probably you could write that conservation easement any way you want with whatever restrictions you want. The question will be whether everybody will find that property 
interesting, interesting enough to buy it. Um, in the case of the easement that Swom has, is holding on this property, which was written by TNC, um, the Nature Conservancy, <clears throat> it says that we have to go ahead and pay out of our pockets any costs we incur to make things right. But if we take the owner to court and the owner is found to be in violation of the conservation easement, we will be reimbursed our expenses. So we've got to be sure that we're right. But in this particular case, we're probably going to spend $10,000 of legal fees in the next six months. Uh, what we will do is go to court and ask for a restraining order that uh, precludes them from any activities on the property until such time as they've made the remediation of all the violations. So that is, I, again, I spent two hours on it today. So that's fresh on my mind and that's what that one says. You could write it that it would say they will be responsible for any cost that the land trust incurs over and above the normal management costs incurred each year. Because you've gotten, hopefully you've got an endowment to cover that cost. Um, sir? Did you get an endowment from uh, Nature Conservancy? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we, they were very good to deal with. They wanted, they wanted to have, they came to us and said, we want to establish a long-term relationship with you. We like what you're doing with what you've got. <clears throat> and we said to them, look, you understand this well enough that you understand the obligations we're taking on. So they actually gave us a 315-acre parcel of land up in, uh, ah, it's just east of South Paris. Anyway, um, it's above term. But uh, anyway, we, we acquired that, and that has a pretty good inventory on it. Uh, and they gave us an endowment of several tens of thousands of dollars. And they gave us the responsibilities to maintain those. But I, I'm feeling very, very burdened, not burdened, but very responsible right now that this is one of the first times in the state. Apparently, the state legislature in the last two years, Richard, you may know this, passed a law that says land trusts have to live up to the responsibilities they have. Is that was there a couple? Was there a couple court cases that are maybe that, that maybe it's the court cases, but yeah. but uh, <clears throat> it was made very clear that land trusts just can't don't have the option of deciding whether or not they want to. If they took the easement, they're going to hold it. They've got the obligation to enforce it. Uh, and so I want, I've always wanted the Swarm Land Trust to be a model for what other land trusts could look to do if they, if they wanted to. At least we could be an example for them of one way to do things. And I think in this case we've got to, we've just got to take these people to court. And an additional um, protection that a landowner has for the conservation easement is that if the third party that's holding the easement, the, say the land trust, if for some reason they're not, you know, fulfilling their obligation. Any citizen can take that uh, to court um, to get a court to enforce the easement. The earlier version of an easement was called a deed restriction, and it was strictly an agreement between the person who's, you know, giving the land to the to the um, to the next landowner. And if that if the terms of the agreement weren't being honored nobody else could have a say in it. It was just between the person receiving the land. But an easement is something that anybody could take to court and get a judgment on. The problem is you can't do much for less than $10,000. <laughs> so it's, it's, you really got to have a lot more. Yes, sir? What about uh, real estate taxes on property that has a conservation easement? If, if someone lets them go in a res and it becomes a lien from the town or whatever. Then I would say that person who's the owner of the land has the risk of losing the property because the town could take it over. They could, but they the could exercise the lien. Continues regardless. But the land trust doesn't have an obligation to pay those property taxes. Okay. If that's your question. Well, that was that was part of it, but I mean the the, uh, the, the, the easement still continues. Yes. Uh, even if someone buys the property, the tax. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's on there forever, which is why. 
they should be used as a good tool for conserving woodlands and farms and whatever you want. I mean, uh, one of the most exciting things I think of going on in agriculture in Maine is the work that John Piotti's done through the uh, Maine Farmland Trust and all the conservation easements that, that, that they've uh, got put on there, on, on farmland that it has to be used for agricultural purposes in the future. Uh, I think that's just as exciting as preserving woodlands. But um, once that conservation goes on, the conservation easement goes on, it's there forever. Questions? Yeah. What's a, a good average age to be thinking about succession planning? <laughs> no. 20. 20? <laughs> 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 <This hour. Good. laughs> I've, got, I've got my daughters thinking about what's going to happen if something happens to them. What's going to happen with the children? Okay, that's the session plan. Um, you know, the three-year-old needs to know what happens if she loses her mother and father. Well, she doesn't need to know it, but I need to know it. Um, so my 20 isn't to be totally f facetious, but I think, assuming you're in normal good health, 55 is probably a good time to start saying what's going to happen to this stuff, and what do my kids want, or what do I, my kids need, and at least start the conversation. Um, I had a situation with my parents. Um, I'm the youngest of three brothers. I had the strongest business background, and my parents asked me to be the executor of their estates. And my father was the second to die, and he was 97 when he died. By the time he died, I was taking care of all his paperwork and doing everything. And he literally went through the normal regression of, of failure, mental and physical. Uh, and his body just wore out. But there was that process of the parent becomes the child and the child becomes the parent, which we all go through, um, <clears throat> or may go through. But um, fortunately, we had started talking about this when they were in their early 60s. And I was actually, because of my business background, I was actually giving them advice and I was handling their investments at that time. Um, and I found it very helpful from my perspective to understand what they wanted because when I became the parent in that relationship, I knew what they wanted, and I knew what they would, even if they weren't able to tell me. Well, by the way, I apologize for this. I changed the oil in my tractor the other day, and I took the garbage to the dump on my way here, and I looked down when I got here, and I realized some of the oil from that. I'm sorry for that. But, but Richard assured me that some of you would understand. <laughs> I have a question. You had suggested earlier in one of your last uh, stories that uh, you were seriously looking at generation skipping, is what I'm going to call it. That's the eight year old grandson. Is that a last ditch effort for you, or is that a serious? Uh, is your advice that we should be looking at generation well, skipping? You have to be careful because there is a, there is a if not a legal, there's an accounting term called generation skipping where you say, I'm not giving my assets to my heirs, I'm giving it to their heirs, their potential heirs. And you just take that right over. Right. Just, and you avoid the tran that second transfer that needs to get it to the third generation. Um, no, I'm, I'm saying that if Owen decides he wants to go to Orono and be a forester, and he wants to move to Western Maine and manage the land, fine. I mean, Owen and I are gonna plant Christmas trees this spring. Um, we're going to prune the peach trees and the apple trees. We're going to pick the blueberries together. His sister's going to make fairy houses with me out in the woods. And we're all going to go for walks. We're all going to play in the mud at the pond. And if they develop a love for the land, my generation skipping is I'm going to want the land to be there for them. Would the land in ownership go to one of my two daughters? Yeah, probably. Whether they'd want to move to the farm or not, I don't know. But if I live to be old enough, this is like 97, like my father, <laughs> if I retain my mental ability, um, which is the bigger question, um, I want to hold it out there for Owen if he wants. But I don't think he will because all he likes to do is this. <laughs> Show him a chainsaw. I've got Jacob as my eight-year-old, and I, he's, I think, might be interested in the chainsaw. I don't know when I'm going to. I never showed him. I never taught his father to use one, but uh, maybe, maybe Jacob might uh, be interested in the chainsaw. So, so I'm not doing formal generation skipping, yeah. but I'm saying if there's an interest there, or 
or Richard, if my daughter, one of my daughters says, okay, I've been around the world, and she has been, and I've done all these other things, and um, I want to be Miss Rumpheus, and maybe you know that story, Miss okay. Rumpheus, one of my daughter's favorite stories for us to read at night. Um, and, uh, oh, I can't think of the author's name, she's great, she's passed away, but, um, Anyway, they, Ms. Rumpheus is a, a woman who goes off and she's a librarian in a big city and when she comes back to Maine, she comes back to Maine to retire and she's the person who's responsible for all the lupins that are planted around the state and so the story goes. And uh, if my younger daughter decides after she's done all these other things and she gets tired of living in the city, she wants to come back to Maine, that's okay too, in which case we won't have a heavy skip a generation to go to one of my daughters. But I, I'm going to hold that option open, but I'm going to keep that place card there in the will that says if we die, conservation easements go on before the properties get liquidated. I have one other unrelated question. You had, there seems to be some interest here in what these folks that are breaking the conservation need are actually doing. I've heard the discussion of this. Could you tell us what they're doing on these land that Swome has gotten from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, essentially, what is it they're doing that's breaking the conservation? I don't know if you could talk about okay. that. Okay, well, because some of it, I won't, I won't call it petty, because they never did it and they knew they had to. But um, <clears throat> the conservation easement says that the conservation holder the easement holder, which is the Swarm Land Trust, will receive a copy of the forest management plan. They never gave it to us. And as a new owner, they had to have a forest management plan because this property had to be uh, third party certified. Um, that means that the land is certified as being managed sustainably and it's being harvested and, and maintained. Well, it's being it's being managed properly um, so we needed the forest management plan they never gave it to us they immediately started a harvest uh, never told us about it the conservation easement called for it um, we, we were supposed to approve the uh, prescription of what the harvest was going to entail the prescription being we're going to go in and we're going to take out various species of various size this is how we're going to do the harvest, and this is how we're going to deal with the post-harvest treatment of the land. None of that was put together, and we never received it. They just simply went out and harvested a, they hired a forester, a good forester, uh, gave him an indication of what they wanted for a level of harvest, and they just went and harvested. Uh, so we didn't find out about it until we looked at the aerials and said, oh my gosh, there's a lot of trees that aren't here anymore. Uh, we put them on notice. That was in 2012. They bought all seven pieces of land. So we put them on notice that they were to do no other activities on any of the seven pieces of land until we got the forest management plan, which they didn't give us, and until we talked about the violations related to the area that they harvested where they had erosion and they hadn't gone back and dealt with it and they hadn't done certain post-harvest treatment that I think should have been done, like seeding down. Um, okay. Is this what you wanted to know? Yep. I um, thought maybe some of the folks might be interested. Yeah. In then last oh. year, they went to a second piece, another parcel, and started another harvest. Again, didn't tell us, <coughs> just went ahead and did it. And didn't return our calls until we had our attorney send a letter off and say, okay, the meter's ticking, we're gonna start charging for our time. Uh, we're bringing in a third party forester to assess what's been done and make recommendations about what needs to be done in order to mediation. And we are now at a point where their attorney has talked to our attorney and she said, we're going to address this and we're gonna call you and um, we're gonna have a meeting. That was 45 days ago and nobody's called. So we're calling them today or tomorrow and saying, when do you want to have this meeting or we're going to court? <coughs> that hand was up first and then I'll get to you. Do you, uh, you do site visits on all your monitoring or do you do uh, aerial photography? We do both. 
We initially order the aerials. Sometimes we use Google Earth if the photos are current. Um, also saves money. But um, we do that initially to see if there's anything that's obvious and where should we start to focus. And then we do a site visit. And we do that at least annually. So can, can the easement include language that would require um, such a situation as that that they would have to forfeit the revenue and estimate of the, of the revenue? Mm -hmm. It could. I mean, there are easements, um, we've got one that says any harvest that, that is done on the land, a certain share of the proceeds of the stumpage proceeds come to small. That was another question that can you share. Yeah. So I think, I think it's pretty open to whatever you want that's reasonable. Obviously, all the parties have to agree sure. to it. Was I clear enough on what succession planning is? Sir? Rich, this might be a kind of an uncomfortable question, but I'm going to ask it. You, you seem to be, you, you have expressed a quandary by saying that you're not sure about the longevity or the, the uh, viability over the course of three or four generations of a conservation easement, and yet you you have illustrated to me tonight that you have a very strong feeling for the land and that as a as a legal vehicle that exists now as good being a good device to uh, conserve land. So the question is. The How question do I is, feel about all that? <laughs> You're the well, ringer in the room, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my answer to you would be, I, I'm, I, I am skeptical that conservation easements, um, I'll give you an example of that. I think my, question, my, my skepticism of my personality makes me wonder if they will be honored 100 or 150 or 200 years from now, because I don't even know how land's going to be used in that period of time. I don't know how uh, climate change is going to change the uses that are of land. I've, I've heard climate control uh, speculation, not climate control, but I've heard speculation about climate change that says that Georgia is going to be a desert. Okay? So I think land use could change and the demographics could be such that we may have to violate some of these conservation easements or overturn them in order to make that land available for other uses. But in our current day and age, I think it's one of the best tools, one of the best conservation tools we have. And it's the one that I'm most comfortable with using to define how that land's going to be used in the future that I control. Any follow-up question? I do. No, well, I, I, I just, uh, I personally would applaud your presentation tonight because it came obviously from the heart and it wasn't abstract in any way. You you told us, you know. Yeah, pretty blunt. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I take uh, heart from the fact that individuals like yourself are in the work of implementing conservation easements and uh, making sure that they're, they're held in a responsible manner. I appreciate, um, appreciate that. And I, I, I wish you, you needn't be so skeptical. We're with you. Right, right. I understand that. Um, the, 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 Steve, I know you had your hand up. I'm going to piggyback on your answer back to Tom, so if you want to pass it along, I can okay, well, jump in. Let me, uh, let me tell you that I work for the Hancock organization. I, I, worked, I get emotional about this, and he's been gone since 1998, but Dave Hancock was the most amazing person I ever worked for. And he was fifth generation of the Hancock family to own the land. They started in business in 1848. That's the first documented time that we can find that the Hancocks had a deal going that related to the land. Uh, and that was to have somebody build them a sawmill. Okay, we actually found the contract. Um, I suspect that they had land activities before that because they needed a sawmill. So I suspect other things been going on. I had the wonderful experience to watch Dave Hancock in his prime um, oversee the transfer of the family resources to the next generation, Kevin and Matt. Uh, I watched a family that um, multiple times has, has transferred successfully the resources onto the next generation and had a capable generation there, both through training and basic intelligence. 
uh, able to manage it in any kind of economic conditions that arose. You know, Kevin just brought the company through um, this most recent recession, and in case you didn't know it, the number of housing starts in Maine dropped 70 percent in volume from 2008 to 2010. So in two years, 70 percent of the housing starts dropped, eliminated, gone, no business, no materials needed. And uh, he brought the company through that period of time successfully and, and they're stronger than ever. So I had a chance to watch secession planning done properly in 1990. David was chairman of AF and PA, which is American Forest and Paper Products. It's an international organization uh, involving Canada and the United States, and he was the president of it, or the chairman of it, for both countries. And he spent 290 days on, the, or 250 days on the road that year, and Toby Hammond and I ran the company. I, I left being treasurer in 84 and went into general management, corporate general manager in 80, in 87. So um, I got to watch him go out and do all kinds of things and see what was going on in the industry. And then he came back and he said to his boys, he said, well, I went to Colby, went to, went to Bowdoin, and he said, um, I want you to do whatever you want to do in life. Kevin, if you want to become a lawyer, you should be. Matt, if you want to be a professional basketball player, you should be. I want you to give me enough time that you can understand the company. Because by this time, we had taken it from a $7 million company to, uh, in the mid 90s, in the early 90s, we were probably 100, and we were probably 80 or 90 million dollars. When I left, we were 150 million, and uh, just before the recession. But he said, you will give me enough time that you will learn about the company. You don't have to come back and work here, but as the next generation, you need to understand it. You need to know how it works so you can give good direction to our professional management. And as a result of it, both boys decided to come back and be part of the company. Uh, it was never pushed on him. The only thing that was pushed on him was that he had a responsibility to understand what happened to Dave Hancock, and now I'll put this, but it was, it was the way the multi-generational situation worked. The reason I'm doing what I'm doing in these presentations, besides the fact I like to talk, is I'm doing it because we don't have a lot of that multi-generational multi impact going on anymore. So we've got to re-institute re it, restart it. Um, but David called <coughs> he was working for a big company, a big Fortune 500 company after he got out of school. Da David's dad called him and said, um, you need to tell me if you're coming back to, he was a little bit blunter than David, he said, you need to tell me if you're coming back to run the company or if I'm going to sell. It. And uh, so David came back to work for summer and decided he liked it and quit his other job and, and ran the company and just did marvelous things. Steve. Well, I'll jump in and applaud the uh, the Hancock lineage, I guess, because here in York County, what we've found that has, I guess, probably created a path of uh, litigiousness and then rules and things like that has been the breakup of, say, the Valley Lumber, just in the opposite down here. So, you know, a lot of the land that we've had and seen in these blocks um, has been broken up, it's been cut hard, and, and this is just the exact opposite of what you've just discussed. So, applaud that kind of uh, piggybacking on the comment about the, the easements and, and, and how that dovetails with the secession planning is that, for Tom's point, we have got to, and this is from someone who reads these easements, tries to work within their uh, guidelines, comply with them for timber harvesting, sustainability, whatever the language happens to be. You had mentioned earlier about the request from the landowner to have the sugar bush always managed as a sugar bush or something like that. If you look at the greater span of the language of what goes on in these easements, we mentioned about deed restrictions, we mentioned about what you can do and what you can't do. If you don't know 50 years from now what a piece of logging equipment is going to look like, what technology is going to do within the woods, what type of tree is going to be growing there, it's almost impossible from a pragmatist like myself to put that faith in a lawyer to write that language to know what's going to happen for that. Yep. So I guess I would come back around to Tom's comment and that that's really where my, I'm not going to call it skepticism, but that's where my worry comes. 
is that from someone who is trying to abide by this language, you've really got to boil the language down, to my knowledge, is to say, I would rather prefer this very specifically not happen on my property, for example, is much easier to enforce. For example, I don't want this lot to be subdivided anymore yeah. than it already has. Is much easier than to say, I wish this to actually happen on this property. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that's going to be. So, and as someone who has seen this language from many different sources of conservation commissions through to nature conservancies and, and every level in between, the language is all over the place. <clears throat> so I have a hard time believing myself, as you, that there won't be some breaking of that language and, and therefore weakening of its structure somewhere along the way. And so as, as a follow-up to that, I'm going to piggyback on yours. Um, <coughs> I think what's going on right now, and I'm not taking one side or the other, but what's going on right now at Goose Rocks is a good example of law that was in place in the past is now being looked at by the court and it's being looked at by the current generation of users or would like to be users are you familiar, all familiar with what i'm talking about yeah there's a question going on i think it's a goose rocks there's a question going on about who owns the property between the high water mark and the low water mark on certain parts of the beach in is that Biddeford? Who owns that? And you know, there's Maine law, and then there's New England, and then there's a European law that goes way back forever. And um, the court, the, the Maine Supreme Court, came back with the ruling and said it's privately owned land, and it's owned all, owned all the way to the bottom of low water. And the towns are now saying, well, we can't accept that because we have a lot of summer tourism who, and those tourists need to get to the water. So we're going to reevaluate and we're going to challenge that. Now, I kind of make sure I don't get on my soapbox, but I am watching this case because what they're saying is, well, people have walked on that land before, and therefore they have a right of way to continue to do that. They've done it for generations, and therefore they have a right of way. To, they have a, a right to do that. Well, is that the same as saying a person that has hunted on my land for several generations, and therefore has a right to recreate on it, recreate on it, even if I don't want to? So we're not just talking about beat frontage. We're talking about what's going to happen on our lands. Does a, does a hunter have a right to walk through your cornfields or your truck farms? Because he's always done it and you've decided to expand your operation and, and take a new field and, and put it into cultivation. And, you know, so I think that as uses change, as machinery changes, um, some of these things are gonna be looked at again and the, and the interpretations <coughs> may be adjusted. And that's where I get skeptical. Our concern. But it's the best thing I know of. We're at 80. Oh, I'm sorry. More questions? No, yeah. I just had a comment, you know, working with the land trust, I've worked with a number of easements. And we do try to make the language um, anticipate you know, future changes in the then current standards or whatever it happens to be. And, um, you know, not, not be so, so specific that it's going to be impossible. To Good. The other thing we've done at Swoam, several years ago, our legal bills were running thirty and forty thousand dollars a year in the trust land trust area. We said we're going to have a standard eighteen page um, easement. If yeah. if you, the donor, wish to modify this, you will pay your own legal fees and our attorney's legal fees to adjust it because we think this is a pretty vanilla down the middle of the road conservation easement related to woodlands. And uh, we've only had one person decide that they needed to make changes since then. Uh, and that, I think it cost them $500 or something because it was just a modest thing. Um, but um, I think land trusts have got to do some of this kind of stuff. And, and I would also tell you as landowners, when you deal with a land trust, make sure they're a good, strong land trust with a viability We've got a lot of land trusts that are getting to the end of their first generation of management, their first generation of boards. People are retiring or dying or whatever. And the question is going to be, are the next 
is the next generation of stewards for the land trust going to be there, or are we going to watch the land trusts merge with each other? Um, what's going to happen? You know, it's it's going to be a, an interesting thing to to see. But make sure you're dealing with a good, strong organization. And above all, figure out what you want to do. Talk to your family about it, and then if you can get some kind of reasonable consensus. Get a professional team together, depending on what you want to do, that may involve an attorney, an accountant, uh, someone who focuses on succession planning. Um, you may want a real estate appraiser. You may want uh, a consulting forester. You may want a family counselor. Those are the f first immediate five I can think of. You may not want any of them, but you may have to have one or two of them. Um, but get, get, get good advice because this is pretty important stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. the time. Oh. I always have to have the last word. On the top of page five, it says final notes. There's a website on here. It's called tiesforland.org. This is the University of Oregon. This is the place where there's the best I think what is the best booklet right now on succession planning is the one they have, and it's called Ties to Land. If you go on and Google it, you'll get right to it. The other really good booklet right now is uh, Your Land, Your Legacy, and it's put out by, it's, it's done by some organization in Massachusetts.